spooky boy season. Hello. Welcome to the scariest show in the world. <laughs> Welcome to the pod, people. I'm uh, scary boy. <laughs> Matisse Van Rossum. I didn't think it's something at time. I'm, I'm the new Loomis, uh, Ben Sheets. <laughs> and it's the moment we've all been waiting for. The new Halloween came out, and we seen to it. And yeah. We go, and we go and talk about we got, it. Yeah, we got um, some thoughts. Almost a, exactly a year since we last talked about Halloween and last year's Halloween spooktacular. Um, I guess we're technically uh, still a week early. Um, it's not quite Halloween yet, but... Hey, but this movie came out on my birthday. We saw it on my birthday. So technically, Halloween is my birthday. That's, so, uh, it's canon. That's true. Let it be written, and it shall be. So this movie has sort of been a point of contention with a lot of people, basically since it was announced almost a year ago. I remember when they released the first poster yeah, I think for we it. Talked I think about we talked this about it in one on of our, our Halloween episodes. episode. You know, up to the release of this movie, it was, you know, something that, the plebes were excited for, but uh, everybody else uh, who's a fan of Halloween was mad about, like, why the fuck are they doing this again? Why are they rebooting Halloween? Why is it ignoring the canon of every movie after the first one? Well, I think between H2O, when they tried to bring Jamie Lee Curtis back, and the Rob Zombie movies, like... People aren't really enthused about a new Halloween movie, even if it features Jamie Lee Curtis. I mean, know? yeah, for sure. Uh, and, you know, generally, I'm also frustrated by rebooting old franchises that don't need to be. But what immediately struck me as interesting about this movie from the moment it was announced is that it's directed by David Gordon Green, a director yeah. who I actually really like. He's had a spotty record, but when he's good, he's really good. Right. Well, like, he notably directed Pineapple Express, which is probably my favorite stoner comedy of all time. I own it. I actually watched it a couple of weeks ago when I was bored. Like, I I really like that movie a lot. And uh, this new Halloween movie was not only written by David Gordon Green, but also by Danny McBride, which I also found intriguing considering his record pretty much exclusively in comedy. Good comedy. He has a good track record, and they've worked together a lot the two of them right um so that was that was enough to keep me intrigued about this movie and not just immediately roll my eyes that it was happening yeah um, the fact that john carpenter uh gave his blessing enough to do the score for also this new one, also that yeah um, like john was carpenter was sign. actually willing to be involved and i mean like john carpenter himself has said like He's open to any of his movies getting remade if it means money for him. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually I saw an article on Twitter uh, a few days ago that was just titled, John Carpenter says that he will do literally anything for money. <laughs> so, you know, I guess as as great of a legacy as he has, he's a total shill even in his old age. But uh, but the fact that he cared enough to come back and do this. Well, yeah, I mean, he score. wasn't he wasn't at all involved in the Rob Zombie films. Yeah. So, like, you know, that's that's something as well. So, I I guess to to make a long story short, like the the year that's been leading up to this movie has had you know a lot of controversy about the movie. So I went in with pretty low expectations despite the good people involved in making this movie like i was ready to be disappointed and i can say that for the most part i was not i actually really liked this movie quite a bit 
Yeah, I mean, I was excited going in after that first trailer. The trailer but, did um, look good. Yeah, that did get me a little bit but, hyped. Uh, yeah, I was really impressed, too, for the most part. In comparison to the Rob Zombie ones, it's a fucking masterpiece. Yeah, I mean, even not in comparison, I still think it's it's a legitimately pretty great film. But, like, Jesus Christ, the comparison is insane yeah i think it like i already more than anything i I already didn't really like the the rob zombie remake but holy shit does this movie basically show you how a halloween reboot can be done well yeah soft soft reboot it's it's a sequel to to the first one but like i said it does ignore all the other films in the franchise none of that is canon i think i think it helps that so many bad halloween movies have come out almost because i feel like if this would have followed directly after the first halloween it may not have been received quite as well no it, it definitely the fact that it is 40 years later and takes place 40 years and later. And we've had so many garbage movie, Halloween movies in between. Right. Well, I mean, I have not actually seen any of the sequels to Halloween. I've, except, for, I mean, I saw the, the two Rob Zombie films. But other than that, I've only seen the original Halloween, and I still thought this movie was successful. Yeah. But it, it is because it is 40 years later, I think, that makes it successful. You know, it would have been really easy to tell basically the same story as the first one and act like it is a reboot, much like the the Rob Zombie one did and I think that would have made it less successful because I think it does a good job of paying uh, homage to the original and also further developing some of the ideas and themes that were established in the original and still have it feel somewhat fresh yeah they do a lot of you know wink and nods to the original but not but I didn't find them fan servicey yeah, and the thing is, it's unlike a lot of more recent horror reboot remakes, it's not tongue-in-cheek about any of it. You right. Know, it plays it very straight. Um, There's plenty of, of comic relief in this movie, but the the stuff that needs to be taken seriously is. Yeah. Which I think y- you you make a good point is part of what makes it work so well, especially considering that this is a David Gordon Green and Danny McBride production. It would have been very easy to make it nudge nudge wink wink, yeah. you know, self-aware, but I I think these people are like true fans of the original and wanted to do it justice. You can tell they wanted to do it right. Yeah. Question. So all the comedy in the movie that was there, did all of it work for you? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, I can't, I can't think of any funny moments where I was like, this is really out of place. There's a couple times where I felt like it, missed the mark one of the biggest examples of that is the sheriff oh the david clark looking motherfucker yeah he he delivers his stuff like it's a joke almost and then just disappears from the movie like yeah i had actually i had actually forgotten about him because he's such an unimportant character yeah well the thing is like he is like the worst sheriff first off you know he's super dismissive about this crazy michael myers well type. he's he's like we can't cancel halloween <laughs> i think he's he's supposed to be like the like the mayor in jaws you know the the dissenting voice that through their carelessness causing a lot of the the death however that being said murray hamilton and and Jaws is a way better example of how to properly do well, that. And I think the other problem is he's just kind of ridden off after a certain point in this right. movie. Well, that's why I forgot about yeah, him. He's um, very unimportant. He has He's in like three or four scenes, maybe. I, it almost makes me feel like 
they had more with him that they cut that out. You think they cut? That yeah. could be. He's not the the primary one investigating or doing the policing or whatever. You know, there's another cop who's who, actually interested, right? And he he was like the the first uh, deputy who responded to to the call back in 1978. He was the first one on the scene, so he has a little bit of background as well. Um, and like you said, he's actually interesting and he takes the thing seriously because he saw firsthand what Michael Myers is capable of. Whereas David Clark, uh, did not, um, maybe we should be careful about calling this guy David Clark because we might catch a frivolous lawsuit. (laughs) (laughs) Allegedly. Allegedly. Like our friend back in Milwaukee who is suing the Milwaukee Sheriff's Department and David Clark. But that's a whole another story for another day. But do you consider him to, to be a character that was intended to be comedic? See, the problem I have is... It was hard to tell because I think part of it was trying to because he's so over the top in comparison to all the other characters. Yeah. He is kind of campy, but it wasn't really fleshed out enough because he disappeared. Yeah. It left me more confused than anything. Yeah, I I mean, I just kind of wrote him off because he's not really important to the story. You know, that's... I consider his whole role to be, like, a minor thing. Like, yeah, he's there to, to be the voice of dissent who won't take the threat seriously and people die because of it but that's all he really is like he's not he's not important to the plot like you could cut him out entirely and nothing about the the story would change yeah i will say a lot of the other comedic elements worked much better for me for example the black kid that's being babysat was oh, one of yeah. the funniest he was so funny. actors I've he was, seen in I think while. he was one of my favorite characters in the movie. Um, the the high schoolers too, I thought were funny and like believably so. Yeah, I thought they were pretty well written. Right, like um, like Danny McBride is a good comedic writer, but one thing that horror movies always do terribly is write teenagers. Yeah, because they're always they always say stuff that was like obviously written by a middle aged man, but this movie didn't have that problem. Like yeah. the kids felt like kids, you know. The only time the the teenagers bothered me was when the dude gets caught making out with the other girl and he takes the girl's phone oh he and takes his girlfriend's phone goop. and throws it in like nacho cheese yeah no that was i i mean that didn't bother me from like a story perspective it just bothered me like that dude was a total fucking asshole yeah it, it's kind of slasher trope getting rid of the cell phone but, right you know, it was it was a convenient way for yeah. her to lose her cell phone before she you know ran into michael myers yeah. shortly thereafter but it, it that was the only slight problem i had with the teenagers the rest of it worked really well and like you said like the dialogue with them is uh, it feels pretty authentic and solid yeah i i like the uh the like generational aspect of this movie a lot where like you have Jamie Lee Curtis obviously is Laurie Strode and she's been traumatized by her experience and has spent like the last 40 years basically becoming a badass and like disaster proofing her house in the hopes that one day Michael Myers will escape and return so she can kill him. Um, and then her daughter played by, uh, Judy Greer, uh, who I always enjoy and stuff and having like her childhood trauma from being raised by this crazy, you know, paranoid woman, like being, a you know, a divide between them and then having the granddaughter who is like our, our, you know, high school protagonist or whatever, uh, that all didn't feel as trite as it could have. I, I think, I, I, think it, I did like it. I think it could have been pushed a little further. I agree. Um, I I honestly wish that Jamie Lee Curtis was a bigger role in this. Like, she's still, you know, pretty important, but 
she's so good that I just wanted more of her. Yeah. I, I definitely cared less about the daughter and the granddaughter than I did about her. Well, because ultimately Halloween I, comes down to I, Michael I, I Myers think and Laurie Strode. We needed Strode. more of Jamie Lee Curtis because yeah. when we do see her on screen, she is kind of all over the place as a character. Like she goes from, uh, you know reclusive to suddenly bawling at a dinner party to uh let's go out on the streets and bring my gun it kind of fit the character i think it works i think it works it bounced well. around so much that i almost wish we had more to take us from I, one extreme to the other i mean i i agree that i wish there was more of that because i think they could they could, you know, flesh it out in interesting ways. But that being said, I think her being kind of all over the place is one of the things that works best about her character because it is a really good representation of what that night in 1978 did to her and how it has dramatically affected the rest of her life. And ultimately she is fixated on Michael Myers and she's paranoid. And, you know, that's why she's been preparing all of this, but she still feels that obligation to her family so she wants to try to be a good mother and grandmother but doesn't really know how to because she never has been before so i think that all of that that push and pull is what makes her character interesting in this movie though i i agree that i think they could have they could have successfully taken it farther. yeah and i, I- I I agree that that stuff is there. I think it just needed to be pushed farther. And especially with, like, using Michael Myers as kind of a metaphor for this generational trauma trauma is ripe for the picking. But it's kind of clumsily done in this movie. I don't know if I would call it clumsy. Just because it's not well executed enough. I would would say... I would say that it's that it's somewhat underdeveloped, but I didn't I didn't find it clumsy, not for me at least. Well, the thing about it is in this movie, Michael Myers is almost an indiscriminate killer at times. First off, I should say this movie is shot fantastically. One yes. of the most striking sequences is this long single take sequence. Oh yeah, that which, was awesome. Uh, Michael Myers gets a knife out of the the tool shed. Well, he and... yeah, he goes f- between two houses right next door to each other and just kills the people inside, like you said, indiscriminately. And it's all done in one shot, and it's really fluid, and it looks great, and it you know makes Michael Myers seem really scary, which I think is important for a movie like this because like he's old in this movie, yeah. you know, like he's in his sixties, and that was one of the things that I was worried about in the the build up to this movie is like is this gonna is this just gonna be two old people like slapping at each other like am I gonna be able to take this seriously is it gonna be is it gonna be like grandparents fighting is it gonna be like watching an Undertaker match in 2018 exactly that's exactly what I was afraid it was gonna be <laughs> but it's not Michael Myers is still actually scary but I before we get too much into him specifically. Um, going back to what you were saying, do you think the fact that Michael Myers is an indiscriminate killer is a problem? I think it works well tonally and stylistically, but in uh, thematically, I think it muddles what it's trying to say a little bit, and it recontextualizes a bit of Michael Myers in the first one. Do, because, I mean, do you think he wasn't as as indiscriminate in the the original film? Well, I I think there was more unknown in the the original, and I think because he kind of preyed on people who were sexually active 
you know, every kill. Yeah, well, for sure. But do you think that he was doing that because as a character, he was sexually frustrated and therefore wanted to kill people having sex? I mean, obviously, I, for, from a thematic standpoint, we as we've talked about on the show before, a lot of like 80s slasher movies, it's like the, the killer is sort of like a, a punishment on immoral. Yeah, teens. yeah. I think there's a lot of ambiguity to the way it's presented in the original. The one thing I do really like in the new one that makes me more okay with how this is all done in this one is how they emphasize the base irrationality of trying to understand Michael Myers. Yes, I like that a lot. Throughout this movie, they do that excellently. And that makes me forgive a lot of the problems I was having with the indiscriminate killer stuff. It's still not flawless to me, but the fact that they used, like, for example, at the beginning, they have a pair of podcasters that are doing, like, a true crime serial killer show. Right. Um, trying to unmask Michael Myers. And, they try to interview him. Yeah, and he's, try he's, to understand hasn't, him. He hasn't spoken in the entire 40 years he's been incarcerated, and yeah. they think that they can finally get him to talk about what he did. Uh, yeah. I, I liked that a lot, too. But you were saying, sorry. It's all about trying to understand Michael Myers. They go to Jamie Lee Curtis's house to try to talk her into like having a one-on-one sit down with Michael Myers. Right, maybe to, he'll talk to her. Yeah. Right? And ultimately, in a way, you could argue that they are part of the reason this chain of events was set in motion to begin with because they brought the original mask right. and showed it to Michael Myers. In a way, you know, you could argue that they were unleashing the shape and he, yeah, he came after them. He remission. came after them later to get the mask back yeah. specifically. Yeah, uh, which I thought was way better than him having hidden it in the house, like in the Rob Zombie remake. Oh and he God. goes back and digs it up. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's actually a really good segue into talking about Michael Myers as a character because I think there's a lot to talk about uh, in this that this movie sort of brings to light. One of the things that I think is the best about this movie is that they don't try to provide backstory or uh, like psychological reasoning for Michael Myers like Rob Zombie did. Like the first 45 fucking minutes of the, that Rob Zombie movie is Michael Myers as a kid and uh, seeing like uh, abusive stepdad, you know, stripper mom, whatever. And they didn't do any of that in this movie. Thank fucking God. Well, thank fucking yeah, God. Yeah, I, I, they gave a lot of tells that they were going to do something like that. They teased it yeah, a lot. They teased and then it they, a lot. And then they don't, which yeah, I which thought is, is great. great. Um, and like, I think that without providing any backstory or anything like that actually does so much to develop the Michael Myers character because you have to think that like at this point, you know, he's, he's in his, he's in his mid sixties and he has been almost continually incarcerated since he was six years old. Six yeah. years, he was six when he first killed his sister and was locked away. You know, then he breaks out for a few days in 78, his killing spree in the original Halloween. But now he's been locked away since then and has never spoken to anybody and, you know, has basically just been dormant this whole time. And to just think that somebody in their 60s has only been free for six years of their life and you know developmental years of their life that they probably don't remember like i don't remember much between the years of my birth and being six years old you know so literally all michael myers knows is being in prison and the one night that he killed a bunch of people yeah you know and it's like 
they always talk about this nebulous concept of Michael Myers being pure evil. Yeah, I and, mean, in the original, it's like Loomis, you know. Right, that's Loomis's whole thing, but that that kind of idea is somewhat hard to grasp, I think. You know, like, he's a human being, you know, there has to be more to it than that. Like, how can somebody just simply be a walking incarnation of pure evil. But this movie kind of gives you the idea that he is because he has been dormant for 40 years. He just exists. He doesn't do anything. But then as soon as he's free, he immediately goes back to like brutally killing people. And it's literally all he knows how to do when he's not killing people. All he does is exist and nothing else. And I think that that makes him so much scarier because it's like, how can a human being just be that? Yeah, well, and I think it takes the ideas of the Loomis character from the original and kind of advances them. It, yeah, that. it makes it seem like he might be um, on to something. He might have been on to yeah. something, you know? Well, we do get a Loomis, or as Jamie Lee Curtis calls him later in the movie, a, the new Loomis. Right. Uh, well, he was he was one of, he says at the beginning that he was one of Loomis's protégés, you know? He studied under Loomis, and he's been in charge of Michael Myers' care and study since Loomis died. So he is similarly obsessed. But I'll let you continue with what you're saying before I get into my problem with that character. <laughs> yeah, well, that character is kind of over the top in this movie. He, it didn't bother me as much as, like, the sheriff did. Um, it didn't bother me until... A specific point yeah and we shouldn't get too deep into that point i think i think it should play <sighs> off as a surprise oh man but that was like my one major problem i with did have a problem with that it was too. that was like my it one was a big left turn for before before we minutes. before we get into that we'll give a hard spoiler warning and if you want us if you want to see this movie without that spoiler then skip over it do we want to go ahead and do that or do you want to yeah, we can throw a okay. spoiler warning. So, hard, hard spoiler warning. If you really want to go into this movie mostly as fresh as possible, stop listening now and come back to it after you've seen the movie. But, okay. So, at a point, the cop, um, who is, you know, at the crime scene in 78, picks up new Loomis and picks up uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's granddaughter and they're driving around looking for Michael Myers. Uh, They see him, and the cop runs him the fuck over because he knows how dangerous he is. As they get out to check on him, New Loomis pulls a, a hidden scalpel that's, like, in his pen, which, first of all, like, I get that you're a doctor, but who makes a scalpel pen? Q from James Bond. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he just like murders the cop like horribly. Yeah. And he takes Michael Myers' mask and puts it on and like puts Michael back in the car or in the back seat of the cop car with the granddaughter. And at this point, I was like, oh no. I got so scared for about 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Because I thought that was really fucking stupid yeah not scared by the movie but scared by well, by the by where they were yeah, taking where they were the direction the, the direction they were taking a movie that i had been really um, enjoying up to this point yeah well in concept i like the idea of you know this guy that studied pure evil so long that he was consumed by it right but the well, way it's executed it, oh, in this movie is just so it's, bad it's too corny like i yeah. agree with you conceptually it's kind of interesting but oh man and it's but like he kills the cop and then as like he's he's just like so that's what it feels like yeah you know and he's he's in an effort to understand michael myers he has killed somebody and i'm just like oh no now is he gonna become a villain like i'm pretty I just, sure 
I just need Michael Myers. Like, I I was so worried. However, the way that they wrap that up I, makes me not hate it too much. Yeah, I groaned when he put on the Michael Myers mm-hmm. mask, though. No, me too. That was, oh my god, that was so fucking stupid. Yeah. Uh, And I was really, really afraid at the direction they were taking it. But shortly thereafter, Michael Myers regains consciousness and, uh, like, he's incapacitated New Loomis. And New Loomis is, like, lying on the ground and he's just like... He's like, say something, like, speak, you know, say anything. And Michael Myers just stomps on his head and crushes it like a watermelon spectacularly. And I was so happy when that happened. Yeah. Because I was afraid they were going to have him say something. That was another one of those bait and switch moments where it's like, oh, no, is this going to be when they finally have Michael Myers talk? And that was like the final fuck you no yeah well they played up throughout the whole movie with the podcasters right i'm glad they didn't ever have him say no me too and i and i like the way that they put like a hard period on that on the end of that statement with that moment you know because that would have been the moment where where lesser filmmakers would have done it you know, even if it had been Michael Myers saying no before he killed him or something like that, like that would have been the obvious dumb thing to do. And they didn't. They, he just crunched the dude's head. It's just like, no, fuck you. We're not going to have Michael Myers talk. That's the goddamn end of it. And so for me, even though it's like the the bus started to swerve off the road and i was afraid that i was going to die cuz the bus driver's drunk you know he corrected and carried yeah. me safely home yeah i in taking it back on track i think it helped emphasize the irrationality of the character right and the refusal to you know rationalize Michael Myers' behavior worked. Right, and Michael Myers has been similarly fixated on Laurie Strode, just like she has on him for all of these years. You know, they've basically, for the past 40 years, just both, like, had their entire wills bent on the other person. So their coming together in the climax makes sense, You know, it's not just like, oh, why didn't he just escape and go somewhere else and do whatever? It's like, no, he has to go back and have his confrontation with Laurie because she's the one who got away. You know, he tried so hard to kill her and he couldn't do it. So he has to go back and finish the job. So, like, honestly, that's all the motivation I need for Michael Myers. You know, he is single-minded. He, you know, you could even argue that he he doesn't even think he's just driven by instinct i i think it, it does a really good job of developing the character and making him still scary 40 years later in a way that rob zombie just could not do you know the best rob zombie could do is the actor that he got to play michael myers is huge he's a big imposing killer with a knife you know what's not to be afraid of but There's much, much more to be afraid of with this Michael Myers. Well, I think in a way with the third act where, you know, Michael Myers finally shows up at the house and confronts the three women, it almost stumbles into kind of thematically some one of its most direct state statements. You know, I I feel like it's almost saying something about the empowerment of women in like a me too era in a way overcoming sexual trauma or overcoming trauma in general right and michael myers and is in a lot of ways the symbol of this trauma because you know it happened four decades ago yet it lives with them generationally right It, it affects the entire family and the person that it happened to has been unable to function normally since then. Yeah. For literally the majority of her life. Yeah, well, and I I don't know if they intentionally meant 
to say something like that, but I, I'm sure we'll get plenty of no, I, I papers think, about that. I think they did. The I years. No, I, I think you're on to something because there was even a lot of talk from Jamie Lee Curtis in interviews leading up to this movie about how it was very relevant to the the me too era and and you know dealing with trauma and stuff like i i think that is straight up exactly what they were intending and i think they did it really well without being heavy-handed I and, think it worked, and making and making their point decisively i think it worked really well in the third act i wish they would have well right there's not much about that in the first two acts that that that's stuff my biggest kinda, problem yeah. with no, it you okay know? I, and I, I see where i think from. that comes back to the underdevelopment of the ideas um because it's kind of a clashing idea between michael myers as this you know irrational the as you know the embodiment of the irrationality of evil and kind of the unknowingness of true evil right like visceral evil and mixing that with this kind of Me Too era metaphor. The ideas in concept mesh well, but in execution left a little bit to be desired. I think I think what would have helped, and this is one of the few times where I think I would advocate for flashback, is I think I would have liked to see a little bit more of... Uh, Judy Greer's character growing up, some of the stuff she dealt with living with Jamie Lee Curtis, and you know maybe a little bit of the of the granddaughter growing up and having you know a grandmother who is trying to be present but isn't really because of a strained relationship with the daughter. Uh, it's established that uh, Judy Greer was taken from Jamie Lee Curtis by uh, yeah. Child Protective Services when she was 12. Very brief. Flashbacks. Very brief, like a little bit to hint at it, but I think you're right that it would have sort of uh, driven some of those themes home a little bit harder if there had been more of that throughout the movie. Yeah, because I feel like these two ideas aren't at odds with each other. They actually kind of work well together. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would have loved to see a little more connectedness. And I wonder if more of that is in an extended cut and they cut it down. Could be. Well, I, I because, think... Because... Go on. Uh, there were things like the sheriff and other things that, you know, weren't completely there and it seems like they cut stuff. Um, but who knows? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Um, but I, I think you're right that, like this particular slasher series serves as a really good vessel for that kind of message specifically because Michael Myers is such a sort of nebulous concept of evil. There is no real reason for what he does. Um, so he's, he's very, he's very good as serving as a metaphor because he's blank. Like, his most defining character trait is that he's very, very bad. And so you can slap the idea of anything very, very bad on Michael Myers, and it works, you know? Especially because this ignores all of the other movies that would try to provide any context to him. Um, they retconned the thing of Laurie Strode being his sister that was established in, that was an H2O originally, right? I believe so. I think so. Um, and that was like a major theme of like the Rob Zombie remakes, you know, that like Laurie is, is Michael Myers' sister and that's why he's so fixated on her. And there's nothing to suggest that in the original film. And the reason he's f so fixated on her in this is because she's unfinished business, you yeah. know, and that's it. And I and I'm I'm on board with that. I I don't think there needs to be that familial tie to make it effective, and I think it's honestly more effective without it because it it does just further add to the irrationality of Michael Myers as a villain. 
uh, that he kills because that is his drive. It's his only drive, and so that's what he does. Yeah. I feel like there's a vaguely supernatural element to Michael Myers as a character. You know, even in the original and this one, in the credits, he's, you know, referred to he's as... He's credited as the, the shape. shape, yeah. And I I kind of love that. You know, I think it's, like, beyond, you know, the vessel of a body he's in. It's the embodiment of evil, ultimately. And that takes the shape, you know? Right. It's... It... The name isn't important. It's it's the the entity, uh, and I like that as a once again very nebulous concept that's never explicitly even suggested, you know. Uh, but just the idea that it fits and that it it makes sense, you know. You could look at it look at it as kind of a supernatural thing if you wanted but even if you don't it still works you know michael myers is kind of like the the slasher villain equivalent of like the everyman protagonist and like video games that's just like a totally blank slate that you're supposed to like put yourself into so you know you play the game without you know having to cater to your character's ethics or whatever and michael myers is he is that except he is anything bad that you want him to be I think that that's one of the few times where underdevelopment of a character is extremely positive. Yeah, I would cuz I cuz I think fleshing Michael Myers out too much makes him a less scary villain. Yeah, well, you rationalize something right. by explaining it too much and and even I if, think you explain a lot in this movie especially by, you know, just his actions without trying to delve into the psychology of right it. exactly and the fact that there isn't really psychology behind it like that he is just a killer and nothing else you know even if you look at other uh slasher franchises of the same era you know something like freddy krueger who you know child murderer who is taking vengeance on those who killed him by killing their children or jason Voorhees, who you know was accidentally killed by bullies you know at camp and so takes vengeance on the very idea of those who bullied him by killing teenagers who are doing drugs and having sex and shit you know and those are you know very basic archetypes that work in their own way for their franchises but michael myers is even more some simplistic than that and just like with any any horror of the unknown you know it al it really allows you to fill in the gaps yourself like michael myers is the slasher embodiment of that and i i love that they just doubled down on that shit in this movie when it would have been so easy to try to put you know rhyme or reason to his madness yeah i totally agree i think keeping him irrational was the best move to go um do you have anything else you want to talk about before well, we let's let's talk about the climax a little bit because i i definitely think there's some good stuff there and i think that there's a lot of good nods to the original in in that whole bit you know, Michael Myers finally comes to Laurie Strode's house that, like I said before, she's been, like, disaster-proofing and invasion-proofing for years. Like, she has a panic room in the basement that's, like, hidden under the kitchen counter, um, which was very cool. She's got, like, metal bars that can, at the push of a button, come down over all the doors. She's basically put together, like, a Home Alone-style House of Horrors to deal with Michael Myers. Um, and what it does really well is it sort of reverses their roles from the original film where the hunter becomes the hunted. Like, at, it never really, like, makes Michael Myers seem, like, weak 
or anything like that, but it definitely puts a lot more power into Laurie's court. Yeah, it, it's funny because Laurie fell into a lot of the same mistakes that she did. She in did. The original. I, I did think it was very funny and also kind of dumb that, like, after all these years of preparing, she almost gets killed by Michael immediately <laughs> when she's like up against the door, yeah. like listening, and his arms just come through the glass and he's starts like choking her it's like Lori, come on you've been preparing for 40 years for this shit you should know better <laughs> um but you know it really turns around and you know you you get her hunting him through the house and they have that confrontation on the second floor where she falls off the balcony and then when michael myers looks down she's gone you know like perfectly recreating the scene from the original where it's the other way around and then later on you have her like come out of the shadows behind him and it's shot and lit almost the exact same way i think that shot in particular is such a good shot for the Me Too metaphor yeah. that they're going for. Because she's finally coming out of the shadows and, you know, confronting her trauma. Exactly. You know, so. And I also really liked how, in the end, it's not just Lori that defeats Michael, that it's the three of them, you know, every member of the of the family you know grandmother mother granddaughter that all come together and defeat him as one you know and it's like well she she may have you know been lousy when these people are growing up but she did adequately prepare them for you know the the time that they would need to most be prepared i thought it was great when Judy Greer and the granddaughter are down in the basement and like Judy Greer has the gun and she's like having the flashbacks to like shooting targets and stuff. And Michael Myers is at the top of the stairs and he's, uh, about to come down or no, no, he, he hasn't come into the room yet. And, you know, Judy Greer starts crying and she's like, she's like, Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. And you're like, Oh shit. Like the, the trauma from childhood is too much. And then as soon as Michael Myers steps to the top of the stairs, like she just totally goes cold face. She's like, gotcha. And shoots him. Yeah, I thought that, that was, was great. that was fucking awesome. And then Jamie Lee Curtis comes from behind him out of the shadows. And then they lock him into the basement and set the house on fire. Although I did think it was weird that she had rigged her house to explode like the plan all along was to make herself homeless <laughs> kill michael myers but destroy her house in the in the process uh, i did think that was a little bit weird maybe it's just an elaborate insurance fraud scheme that's what it is <laughs> damn uh, on that shit and i and i like how you know that was another moment where you think where you think that uh, oh, you know, maybe we're Michael's gonna speak or something like that when the the gate has come across the basement stairs and the house is burning. You just get that shot where like Laurie and Michael make eye contact and he's just still totally emotionless, just standing there as like he's about to be consumed in flames and like he's just evil and unfeeling and heartless until the end but then when they leave it cuts back to the basement and he's nowhere to be seen which i liked yeah. because it's like well you think oh well there's no way he could have gotten out of that and maybe that's true but we don't explicitly see him die well yeah and that's the thing too it really emphasizes that the shape is beyond just a, a vessel right. of a body. And, you know, we didn't stay around for it, but apparently after the credits, you can hear Michael Myers breathing, or I guess you could say the shape breathing. I, I will say I hope that this is the end of it. I hope they don't feel compelled to make a sequel if this one is, is successful. I like the ambiguity of him possibly getting away. I even like, you know 
the idea of hearing him breathe at the end of the credits, so it leaves it very open-ended, but I do not need this to continue. I think this film did a really great job of being a spiritual and literal successor to the original 40 years later, something that I did not think could be done successfully, but please, for the love of God, let's just be done now. It shouldn't be a super direct sequel if it is there is a sequel. I don't I man. I think if anything it's more of a spiritual success or something where the shape takes the form of someone else. If it was like, something like that then maybe, but I don't know if they if anybody would have the balls to to try to do something like that. I don't know. Like I suppose it could be done, but I I think that this film I think this movie did pretty well at the box office. Yeah, I think it's been doing well. It's it's gotten uh, pretty positive reviews from critics. Um, there's there's backlash, you know, from from moviegoers who uh, you know don't think that this movie needs to exist, so on and so forth. But I think if you're going to uh, try to do another halloween film 40 years after the original i think this is the way to do it i i was extremely pleasantly surprised and i think they did the film justice without making a soft reboot that felt like fan service i'll go ahead and slap a rating onto that because i think that pretty well encapsulates my feelings on this movie Overall, I liked this movie a lot more than I expected. Um, I think I'm going to give this a, a, a strong four and a half out of five pods. I think it's it's uh, a really, really well done slasher film. An excellent continuation of Halloween provides good development for both Laurie and Michael Myers uh, that isn't overdone or corny shot beautifully, acted really well, well written comedy that doesn't feel out of place, some really great kills. We didn't really talk about that, but it's pretty fucking gory and there's some real nasty kills that I really appreciated. Um yeah, overall I I really really liked this film. Yeah, I you know, I think this is one of the best soft reboots I've ever seen. Um, it does a great job capturing the spirit of the original in a lot of ways and taking a lot of the ideas from it and putting its own spin on them. I think at times some of the thematic material was a little undercooked just because they were going at some really interesting ideas, but they didn't quite flesh them out as much as they I would have liked. Um, that being said, the cinematography is excellent. The practical effects are excellent. The pacing is excellent. The score by John Carpenter is excellent. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk like, about that. This movie is awesome. This is one of the better soft reboots I've ever seen. And it's how to take an old franchise like Halloween and breathe a breath of fresh air into it. Like you said, I don't really want them to do another one, but I, if they ever did, I would have full faith in uh, Danny McBride and David Gordon Green to do something interesting, at least, uh, after this movie. I would give it a strong four out of five. Um, it's really good. All right, so that's an average of 4.3 out of five pods for Halloween 2018. Uh, before we move on, one last thing I want to mention is that it's still a, a new movie, so it's hard to say for sure, but I would be willing to bet that this movie doesn't get any sort of accolades or recognition for its female protagonists and like doing a movie with like good female characters and stuff similarly to annihilation earlier this year you know they're still just gonna dump all this fucking money into like rebooting old movies with all female characters like with ghostbusters and making bad movies and then calling anybody who doesn't like it misogynist because oh you just don't want to see women in this stuff it's like no 
pay attention to these fucking movies that do it goddamn right. There was no talk about that after Annihilation. I doubt there's going to be much talk after this movie. Could be wrong. I hope so. But it's like, these are the kind of movies that I will, you know, point at when people get up on their high horse about not liking a movie like Ghostbusters. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like just, you know, people wanting to be outraged about something and totally ignoring films that do what they're trying to accomplish successfully. Yeah, I think the only solution is making an all-female Friday the 13th with a female Jason. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, that'll do it. All right, but I'm not going to go off on that tangent too hard. Uh, Instead, I'm going to take us into our favorite place, the Metacritic Corner. You freaking bricks! Um, So this is going to be a shorter one than last week. Ultimately, every negative review I've seen of this movie has all been about, like, why you do this, no need for this movie, Halloween is perfect, how dare you. Um, So I'm going to read one of those from Metacritic user AxeT. Beyond reboot, beyond chronic sequelitis, beyond unnecessary. Though conventionally well-made and competently delivering for its audience, it's also exactly the predictable retread of gore and bore anyone of sound mind would expect and avoid, including old fans of the classic original, the one that started the whole slasher thriller subgenre and a clever, deservingly praised little movie at that. It feels much longer than it actually is, with the only viewers who would possibly be entertained being the young who have not seen this schlock all before, and maybe the mentally retarded. (laughs) Jesus Christ, that went zero to a hundred real quick. Yeah, so basically, this person is calling us young who have not seen the original, or mentally retarded. Well, I find it so rich that he calls this one a boring movie when the original is such a slow burn. Right. You know? <laughs> but I guess we're mentally retarded because I've definitely seen the original before, so thanks for letting me know, Axe T. The, ma- the, <laughs> the makers and marketers are so vapid and lazy they couldn't or stupidly chose not to even come up with a variant on the original title, which is nonsensical since it's not a remake and will only lead to pointless confusion in the future with duplicate titles. That I actually agree with. So even though he called me a retard... He brought it home with a very valid point, one that I have said myself a couple of times on this show. Three out of ten. Oh, God. I kind of feel like the people like this who are such huge fans of the original going into this movie and coming out with such a bad experience, I feel like it's it's got to be because they want it to be bad. They well, they they have an idea of the sanctity of the original and they don't think that a good sequel or soft reboot can be made 40 years later and so they go into it expecting it to be bad and therefore see it as bad. The thing that baffles me is the last Halloween movies were the Rob Zombie ones. Right. I don't know how you can go from those to this. And be like, oh yeah, this new one, shit, three out of ten. Right. Like, Rob Zombie set the bar so goddamn low. Like, like ten years yeah, ago. Yeah, even if you don't you know, think this like, new one is all that good, like, it, comparatively, yeah. you know, it's so much better. Right. Well, that... That's all for Metacritic Corner this week. I just wanted to get into that person's head a little bit. 
so next week is Halloween. We're going to be releasing our next episode a day early since Halloween is on a Wednesday this year. Um, and, uh, we're going to be talking about a little old anthology film called Trick or Treat. Yeah, I think this movie is going to be really fun to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I, I've only seen Trick or Treat once and it's been a little while, so it, I'm going to be glad to refresh my memory, but I remember liking this movie a lot. Yeah, no, I, I really like it. It was directed by the same people who did Krampus. Yeah, uh Michael Doherty, I think is the director's I name. I believe so, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to talk about this movie and uh cuz it's an anthology film and it's our Halloween special, you know, we'll be able to spend some time uh getting into each of the the stories that it tells. I think it's four, right? Is it 3 or 4? Four, I think four and then like a you know a rap yeah a, yeah uh, a framing narrative um but yeah so that'll be uh you know a fun little romp we get to go on so if you're ready to get spooked with us check back in next week for that uh if you like the show don't forget to leave us a rating and review on apple podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts if you haven't done that already we love you we appreciate you uh, follow us on Twitter at Pod People Pod. Um, we post updates and stuff there. You know, uh, if for some reason our busy lives interfere with the schedule of our show, which happens a lot. Uh, follow us on Letterboxd uh, at letterboxcom slash Pod, where we have a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those episodes. Um, if it's your jam, you can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Van Awesome. And I'm at Mr. Sheets. Thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, let us know what you thought of the new Halloween movie. Uh, did you like it, or were you one of those people that really thinks that it was pointless and unnecessary and didn't need to happen? Uh, if so, let us know why. Yeah. Because uh, uh... I, I think that... Halloween 2018 was a really, really great film. Question of the week. Uh, pitch us your idea for a Halloween sequel to this yeah. 28 ha- If Yeah, if you've Halloween. seen this one, tell us what you think would be a cool sequel to it. I'm curious. Um, well, that'll about do it for us. And until next week, check your candy for razor blades because I put a lot in there. Mm-hmm.